Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I hope you all had a good evening or last or good night, a good sleep. Uh, but we're going to begin our study here with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the time we have to study uh, this morning and the afternoon for Stephen. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit can touch all who are looking into these truths, whether it's live here in these studies or whether they're watching them later. We pray, Lord, that you can help them in their day-to-day -day battle with self and with the forces around us that seek to discourage and injure your truth. Help us to cling to your promises in spite of what we see. We pray that your spirit can be here now as we open your word together. We ask that we can be united with you and with one another through your spirit. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so when we finished here um, in the book of Judges, um, we were dealing with uh, uh, just going to start looking into chapter 12. Um, and, and we had dealt with Jephthah's, Jephthah's tragic vow. And we had come to understand that this related to uh, the prediction regarding Nashville. And um, so I'm just kind of summing this up. And just to look at this chart over here uh, that I drew out, which is still on the whiteboard behind me, but I, I drew it out like this. We can see that um, this 777 days at the end uh, represents a connection with the 777 days at the beginning. This is the 300 years of Judges 1126, which we take as a period of 30 years. And we dealt with the Ark and all of these different symbols. And um, in this, the, the whole idea here is that the story of Jephthah is covering this period that is especially this last part here of what's happening in the movement presently. So with the failure of July 18th, uh, the movement was in a crisis. And um, what, we, what we see when we go back to Judges chapter 12 is that crisis, um, which is this conflict with Ephraim. And so we're going to, to try to look at this and, and try to understand how this relates to the present time and, and then put this on the line. So we know that FFA is gone. The School of the Prophets has been sold. And um, then we have to figure out where this story fits into that. So let's let's read and try to, to um, try to figure this out. So I know that um, we've we've had ideas before when we went through this, but now we're being a bit more precise when we're putting it on the line. The men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? And Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, 
The Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, nay, then said they unto him, say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame or pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then he died, then died Jephthah, the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. So what does this story remind us of? This, the men of Ephraim here in their response. When we go back to Judges 8.1, Okay, so we had this situation uh, with Gideon, right? Right. Now, now Gideon was able to appease the men of Ephraim, right, by his, by his response. Now, the men of Ephraim here, what did they represent in the story of Gideon? Do we remember how we how we address? Did we say that those are representative of the church? Well, I know we tried to say that, but I don't think that was our conclusion because okay. this is about internally within the movement, right? Okay, so in this story of Gideon, uh, this would have represented um, people in the movement. Right. So um, and this would have been people in the movement. Um, well, because <clears throat> we'd have to go back and look at the whole context here. But remember that Gideon represents the message of July 18th. Right. And we had put um, six, seven and eight on a line. Remember that? Right. And, and each of these were these symbolic representations I could probably uh, bring that chart up and that would help us a little bit. Yeah, here it is. So when we put six, seven, and eight on a line, um, it's um, judges eight is going to be this zoom into December 25th, 2021. And this is going to be about the men of Ephraim are going to be the people who, where we have this sort of um, controversy at that time. Does that make sense? Okay. So this issue of the men of Ephraim has to do internally within the movement. Um, so we have Gideon is in, in this part of this story is um, um, well, if I go back here, so we'll see what I'm talking about. Because I think it's important to understand the men of Ephraim here, because it's going to really be the same group of people, it, though in a different story, but it's going to represent the same thing. Well, in other words, those within the movement that were pacified by Gideon are not pacified at this point by Jephthah. Right. Yes. So so this had to do with Ziba and Zalmuna, these messages. Right. Which, which we took as being these two messages of Collins and uh, Odilios. All right. Right. So I had put. Because um, in Judges 8.8, 8, it's going to talk about uh, they went up thence to Penuel. So you're going to have Penuel and. Um, Sukkoth, right? All right. Have this in this story of so in Judges eight, they're going to defeat Ziba and Zamuna, right? And that's where this whole situation is arising. 
So I, I'm not, I don't want to get into too much detail here other than to recognize that these men of Ephraim represent the people in the movement uh, who are still, they had been called, but they haven't been really studying the message. Let's, let's put it that way. Right? Does that right. make sense? Okay. So when we get over to uh, Jephthah's conflict with Ephraim, the men of Ephraim still have this same sort of attitude. Like that, that is, they feel that they're not being called, right? In, in, the, in the story of Gideon. Okay. And here, again, thou didst not call us to go with thee. So why are they not feeling that they're called? Why do they feel that that these messages of July 18th are moving without them? Well, if we went back to what we were looking at in 6, 7, and 8. Yeah. They didn't feel the urgency to join with Gideon. Yeah, so they I think that's brought up very clearly in the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, and and so the men of Ephraim is, um, I mean, again, this is a message where people are attached to a message, right? So it's, it's sort of an attitude um, that exists where people are not really studying on their own and don't understand what's going on, but they've had this opportunity to study on their own and understand what's going on. And when things happen that they don't uh, feel that they're a part of, they make accusations. Is that a fair enough description of, of the men of Ephraim? That's a good analogy. Okay. So, <clears throat> and, and this is a problem that, that we've faced. I've faced personally with people, you know, they've, they're like, well, you're moving too fast. You need to simplify things. Um, you're not in step with the movement. Um, when in reality, they're just not following the light. Because right? they're not studying. And, and, you know, this, this I've experienced, you know, in my whole time as a Seventh-day Adventist, whether, it, you know, whether it was in the upper room studies or other times, is that, you know, God is giving light to his people. And there are people who do casual sort of study. That is, they will come to a Bible study once a week, but they don't crack their Bible uh, the rest of the time. But is there, and even if they do read, they might read some devotionals or something, but they're not actually studying out the things that are being studied. And if that's the case, they're not going to understand what's happening. And that's not the responsibility of the people who are leading out in studies. Right? You can't blame, you know, you can't blame me in the upper room studies because people tried to blame me that we were moving too fast. You know, this was years ago um, in our studies. You can't blame me for that because they just weren't studying. And, and so I don't know how you can correct that. I mean, I don't know how, you know, as a guitar teacher, I can do, all I can during the lesson, but if that student doesn't pick up his guitar in between lessons, um, they could try to blame me and say, I'm not a good teacher. But if I've done everything I possibly can and they just haven't picked it up, that, that's not my responsibility. I mean, I have to do everything I can. If I haven't done everything I can, then, you know, that's a different story. But I think that we have done everything we could before July 18th and after July 18th to make these truths available. And if somebody has not studied them, they can't blame us for that. Well, they can try. 
Well, they can try, but they can't justly blame us. No, I mean, but isn't that, you know, really the human condition? Because they choose not to avail themselves of what's available. And then when these truths are being presented and it's like slapping them in the face, they come back with the attitude that, well, you know, I just don't see this. Haven't yeah. you run into that? Yep. Yeah. And, and, and then they will say, well, there's so many videos to watch. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, you just start wherever you can. You know, if you have to go back and start at the beginning, then you do that. We are each given the same amount of time. We are each given the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. The choices we make with our opportunities will help to define our characters. Mm -hmm. Right now, we could be attempting a study of the same pablum that has been being given by the corporate church for years mm -hmm. but is it satisfying is it something that's going to give us a an understanding of that which is really going on and that which we need to see changed in our lives. Mm -hmm. So when we're going back over the same things that are basic Adventist understanding, when we're sticking with the milk of the word mm -hmm. and choosing to ignore the meat are we not remaining as babies instead of progressing to attempting to become adults? Yeah, that's the way that I understand it. it, it I mean, in talking about this, I don't like talking about it. I mean, it, oh, I know that. Um, I mean, I'm actually shaking when I talk about it. It, it. it just upsets me so much in the sense that, I feel I feel it to me it seems in a sense hard to say this to people. Well, okay. But, but I don't I don't I don't understand why people don't study. It just like if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you take that seriously, you should be studying your Bible, and you should have been studying your Bible the entire time that you've been an Adventist, and even before, you know, as soon as you knew of the truth. You should have been studying. And I don't think anybody can ever have an, as an excuse that they didn't have time to study. I used to work 100 hours a week. I still studied all the time. You know, I mean, I studied when I was driving. I would be studying. I would be going through uh, passages of scripture in my mind. Um, you know, that's, that's what I thought about as a Seventh-day Adventist is God's word. And, and trying to understand things, trying to sort through. I always had some problem, something that I was studying and thinking about and trying to understand. I didn't just, you know, forget about the Bible when it wasn't Sabbath. And so I don't think I'm being too hard on people that they need to study the Bible. Because it's life and death. So... So the, to me, the children of Ephraim represents this attitude. And, and we know that Ephraim, of course, is the largest of the northern tribes. It's the one that ends up, you know, you, you talk about northern Israel, you call it Ephraim. But it's in idolatry. And what is the idolatry of Ephraim? 
How would we characterize that today? Would it just be simply that they're, they're worldly minded? That they don't care about the things of God, even though they profess to be God's people? It's all just a pretense. For a lot of them, unfortunately, it is a pretense. And and it's the studying of God's word in a way that it's it's laziness. It's asking somebody else to do something for you that you only can do for yourself. No one else can do it for you. I mean, as a teacher, I can I can simplify things, I can prepare materials, I can study and understand it and put it into uh, explain it in ways that it could be understood on different levels. But I can't study for you. Right? A teacher can't study for his students. I can't practice the guitar for my guitar students. They have to pick up the guitar and practice it. And if we can't understand these things, it's because we haven't taken the time and energy to understand these things. You know, some of these things are difficult to understand. There's no doubt about it. But they're not beyond our abilities. Because God is the one that enables us to understand these things. It's through the Holy Spirit. So, <clears throat> so in these stories, we have the men of Ephraim. And they're, they're coming sort of near the end of these stories, right? After, after the battles have begun. And, and they're not 11th hour workers because they're not actually, um, I mean, in a sense, you could say in Judges 8, they, they kind of are. But... Um, They're not, they're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Just simply that, you know, they're not following God's counsel and they can end up being fighting against the message. Which is what happens here in, in, in this story of Jephthah. So, um, so picking up some things here. So if they're at strife with the children of Ammon, we know that the children of Ammon, uh, what, what are they representing in this story of Jephthah? More of a false message. Okay. So there is... A false message. So this this is a message that has been um, inherited from Parminder, if we want to put it that way, simply, right? Right. It's this oppression, and 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 it's not just Parminder. It's it's a message from the church. If you want to look at it, it is uh, Adventism, right? Because this message from 9-11 has to address this problem, uh, which is uh, the Ammonites. So they're, they're, they're fighting against this message that has been hindering them or oppressing them. And so this message, the message of Jephthah, is um, at the end of this 18 years of oppression, that the message of Jephthah arrives, and it, it is that message of the 777, right? So it's basically the same message as Gideon, but expressed differently. So it's July 18th. But the men of Ephraim, they gathered themselves together and went northward. 
Okay, so they're going northward. Why are they going northward? I mean, in in the story. Okay, so they're crossing the Jordan, right? They're going right. to the land of Manasseh and Gilead. Right. right. Um, and, and it's interesting here, this is in, um, who's coming? this is John Gill's commentary. Uh, he just says, um, they went over northward, that is, over the river Jordan, which lay between Gilead and Ephraim. And when they had crossed the river, they turned northward, uh, for Mizpah, where Jephthah lived, was in the north of the land near Hermon and Lebanon. And Mount Hermon, what's that area? What's Hermon? I'm not visualizing it. Okay, Herman is Paneum. Okay. Right? All right. Okay. So, so if they're going northward to Paneum, what does that mean? They're going north to fight against the king that is coming from the north. Okay, so they're 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 taking this message of Raphi and Paneum, right? So they're they're seeing that there's something there, however we want to look at it. This is the, the message of the king of the north. But they're they're not agreeing with the message of Jephthah. But the other the other oh. part of this too mm -hmm. from Judges twelve four is as it says and the men of gilead smote ephraim because they said you gileadites are fugitives of ephraim among the ephraimites and among the Man manassites okay yeah so is this not a remnant of a remnant well well there's an accusation being made here okay so if the accusation is you really are Ephraimites. You're fugitives. Now, why would they say that? Are they saying basically you're not part of us? Well, you, yeah, you're really fugitives of us. Now, we know, of course, the Gileadites are, are Manassites. Okay. So ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. So he's saying, yeah, you don't really belong to either Ephraim or Manasseh. That's what they're saying. Right. And um, now isn't doesn't that also apply with what we've been seeing today mm -hmm. with the American group and the Canadian group against, you know, everything that we've been studying? Yes. Yeah. Now, so this is a point, though, where that we're coming to that I don't think we're at yet. So whatever this means in Jephthah's conflict with Ephraim, this is happening after some sort of uh, victory that the message of Ephraim has. Right. So this isn't just July 18th itself. This is at the end of this period. So this is the period in which we are in or entering into that the men of Ephraim are warring against uh, the message of Jephthah. And, and so maybe we've entered into that already. I would think we have. So, 
you know, right now, and the thing that, you know, we don't have much time. We, we, we have to actually discuss and figure out what we're going to do as far as uh, December 24th. Um, but, but we know that we need to invite again um, the American and the Canadian groups to our studies. And, and, and I'm thinking that that's where we're, we're approaching this point where we're coming into a more direct conflict with uh, these groups, with the men of Ephraim. So, you know, because it has to come to a point where we, we, people make their stand, so to speak. I mean, and, and I'm not wanting to force the issue, but it's just, it seems to me that that's the direction we're going. I don't know if people agree with me on that. Well, I think we, we have come to that conclusion a long time ago. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, but it's it's not a good conclusion to come to. Unfortunately, it's a conclusion that that's going to have to be faced. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I don't know, you know, what we're going to do, and we're going to have to talk about this a bit more. But I mean, as I've said before, it'd be nice to have Toby present a message on that Sabbath. Um, you know, if that's possible, I don't know, Dwight, if you can get in contact with him, talk to him about it. I'll see what I can do. You know, sort of explain what's been happening. But, you know, we need to come to that point of the upper room, right? So that, and and we can't force that. We can't force it on anyone um, because it is an individual work. But it is a work where the movement comes together in unity, and it has to. You know, this, this type of division that we see here with the men of Ephraim and the men of Gilead and Manasseh is wrong. That shouldn't have been happening, and it shouldn't have been happening in this movement. <clears throat> So, when Jephthah, so Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? And Jephthah, and that's where we get verse four in, in this sort of your fugitives. You're not really um, following in this message. You know, that is the American and the Canadian groups believe, or many people believe, that they are in the message, that they're following this. And when they see people doing something in their mind, going ahead of the message or whatever, however they want to characterize it, teaching things that they don't understand, um, they just attack that message they attack the people who are giving that message now we then have the gileadites in verse five took the passages of jordan before the ephraimites right so we know that the ephraimites are going to cross over the jordan but the gileadites are going to take those passages and they're going to question the ephraimites with this shibboleth and so what is the shibboleth? What is it that the Ephraimites cannot do? Um, that the Gileadites can. I mean, literally, we know it's the pronoun pronunciation of the letter shin. Right. So they can't say shin. They can only say sin. Right. So they can't say shibboleth. They can only say sibboleth. Right. It, how is it? The Gileadites took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so 
that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto them, art thou an Ephraimite? And if he say nay, right? So if they deny being an Ephraimite, he's going to say, now say Shibboleth. But the Sibboleth is going to give away the Ephraimite. So what is it? What is this about? All right. When we're looking at this with Shibboleth. Yeah. The alternate reading that I'm looking at and the additional verses that the translators had looked at. Yeah. Alternate reading would be that which signifieth a stream or a flood. Okay. Yeah, because that's when they're crossing the Jordan. So they just say, you know, can you say this word, what you're crossing? And if, I, if I'm if i reading this correctly on Sibboleth, that this would not so much be a stream or a flood, but would be an ear of grain. Right. Yeah, because if you put the Samic there instead of the Shin, it, 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 has, it changes the meaning of the word. Okay, now the alternate verses would take us to Psalms 69, verse 2, to begin with. Okay, so Psalm 69, 2. I sink deep in, I sink deep in mire where there is no standing. I'm coming to deep waters where the waters overflow me. And so there you go. Floods gonna... overflow me. Floods overflow me, yeah. Now, you're going to get this word, uh, shibboleth. That's the word floods. Okay. Um, and then we have Psalm 6915. Yeah. yeah. So, again, it's going to be uh, the water flood in that case, overflow. But let not water. the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Mm -hmm. So this is really about the Sunday law. Okay. And then you've got Isaiah 27, 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel. So that again is going to be the word shibboleth. Of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. Okay, now, the one thing that I'm seeing with this, mm -hmm. and here, you know, I'm more than willing to address this, but we, we need to look at this in a deeper manner. First off, we're dealing with Judges 12.6. Right, exactly. So this has to do with the 25.20. Okay. We have the Shibboleth or a stream or flood. Yeah. Now, we know that light is going to come, and it's going to come at the end in a very fast manner, almost like that of a flood. What if this with Shibboleth is telling us we need to be recognizing patterns and not attempting, like with this with Shibboleth, to be making prophecies tied with time? We've seen what, what just occurred in this situation with Colin. There's been a lot of light that has come from what both Colin and Odilio have presented. But the situation on the recent elections, the situation with the issues that that were presented that were supposed to happen have not happened. Yeah. Now we're in a situation where there is a lot of light that has come out, 
But as we have been studying, we are also finding patterns. Right. And we can recognize a pattern. We can see that a pattern is presenting something for our edification. Mm -hmm. Now, we have been addressing what we're seeing that, that could very easily have import regarding uh, 2023 and 2030. Yep. But there are other things and other patterns that we're going to have to be looking at to determine other way marks that we may see that we may have to apply in the in the course that we're going to see happening over the next few years. Right. And so we have a um so we have this shibboleth, this this flood, this right. stream, which which to me represents, of course, the the coming Sunday law. Okay, right, but it's it's the message of that, right? Because this message is tied up in, in understanding the Sunday law. That's primarily what this movement is about. And but then you have a sibilant, which is an ear of grain or wheat. Um, now I think of that as the wave sheaf offering. I mean, it's you know because I've been studying that. And so if we have this uh, the sibilant, um, that is is the offering of grain before the harvest is going to occur. But there are people that aren't moving beyond that, right? That is, they understand partially the truth, but they don't understand the whole truth. That is, they can't frame it correctly. Right. So so we can't, you know, the one thing I, I'm, I'm not arguing is that Odilio and Colin are teaching error in the sense of how they've laid out the lines. It's simply in their interpretation of what those lines mean in connection with the Sunday law. That is, the big problem that this movement has is we haven't been able to grasp that we're in a, a typical line, that we're not in the actual line of the Sunday law itself. And we should, we should understand this quite clearly from everything that we've studied, that the Sunday law is something that on Ellen White's line um, is where the angel of Revelation 18 arrives. But we know that on our line, the angel of Revelation 18 arrives at 9-11. And then we also know that we have all of these other lines within these lines, which now we understand are zoom into's. That is, our line is a zoom into the Sunday law. That is the line that includes, you know, from 1989 to the Sunday law. And even beyond that is a zoom into the Sunday law line. But then we've zoomed into different way marks on that line to create other lines, right? So, so we've understood this clearly because we saw it in the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We, we've seen it all the way through that we can look at a way mark and see another line. And so we're making this mistake of believing that our line is the real line, that, that our line contains the Sunday law, but it doesn't our line is a type of what's to come now people can say well that's that's preaching a peace and safety message but it's not because for us in this movement there is no peace and safety we can't just put off um saying, well, if the Sunday law is in the future, I'm just going to put it off, because what will happen if we do that? We put off this study. We will be on the wrong side of the issue. Right? Just like the... On the yeah. Right? So, 
So we won't understand um, what's happening. We will, we will be deceived because we have light that if we reject it and neglect it, we're going to close our probations. We will have received too much light to be um, awakened by any further light. We will have go gone so far into darkness that no light can reach us because we're not willing to look at our true spiritual condition. And if we're not able to look at our true spiritual condition now with the light we have, we're not going to be able to look at our true spiritual condition later. We will have made our decisions because we received great light and rejected it. And this is the problem with the children of Ephraim. They had light, but they neglected and rejected that light. And so they can't discern the truth. They can't frame it correctly. I think it's interesting that this verse is presented for us with the attachment of 126. Right. So when we looked at it before, we noticed the, the 12.6, the 126. Um, and so when we're taking this, this message um, of Jephthah, this part here with the Ephraimites fighting against the message of Jephthah, and the message of Jephthah is particularly um, well, it's, it's the message. And another way you could look at this, is this also December 26th? No, it's December 6th. Okay, it's December 6th, but is it also December 26th? We know it's December 6th. Okay, but how would you see it as December 26th? Oh, I'm just going to double that too. 1226. Okay. Just uh, and, and what I'm saying about that is this study that we're doing right now began on December 26, 2021. And, and, it's, and it's going to have its anniversary on December 26, 2022, with study number 252. That'll be interesting. Right. So, so I'm just saying that this 126 also represents the 252. And it represents this anniversary of this study, the beginning of the study and the anniversary of it. But I think from the time of December 26th, when we began this study, when we get to December 26, 2022, this movement in some way is entering into a point where we have to be making a choice of what, what it is we're following. What, what message we are following, not what people we're following, because we're not following people, we're following Christ. And what message we're going to support. Right? And then we have, you know, January 11th being study number 264. That's, that's the message of Islam. It's also a message of the prophetic mirror, right? Because the right. prophetic mirror is 2,604 years in length. And, and that's the end of the Collins prophetic mirror, right? January 11th, 2023. Because he has this prophetic mirror structure. And so that our study is going to be number 264 fits in with that idea of the prophetic mirror as well. So that means we have a 252 on December 26th, and then we have a 264, the end of the prophetic mirror, on January 11th. Does that make sense? That this is the message that, that we have been studying that is the message that we should be supporting.
you're bringing out some very interesting numerical points. Yeah. And, and this wasn't designed by anybody. I mean, when we began these studies, we weren't planning any of this out. We had no idea about any of this. And, and you know, we missed some studies because of circumstances, like holidays and things. Uh, but this is, this is the direction that it's been going. And, and so all through this time, we have, been, we have been seeking to understand the truth, but there are those that are not. They're the children of Ephraim, right? Yeah, it's like they want something, in, instead of something that is foundational, they want something that is more exciting, titillating. Yeah. Now, and I mean, in no way do we like even talking about this. I mean, and, and it's not an us and them either. It's not like we're the right ones and you're the wrong ones and some sort of, you know, mocking in that sense. Because we don't really know whether we are the children of Ephraim or we are Jephthah in the sense of individually. You know, just because we're it's following some studies or some other studies, it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, we know that there is the true message. And, and that message would have to be the message of July 18th and all connected with it. And so a person could take these studies and, and decide something different about them. You know, but I would say it, it seems to me quite clear that from what we have studied and how we've put these things together, that um, this conflict in the story of Jephthah, it occurs on the anniversary of the beginning of these studies. So, I mean, we got the 24th, the 25th, the 26th. So we got the Sabbath, the um, and then Christmas Day on 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 Sunday, and then the 26th. But at some point, this this message has to come to uh, this this issue, and we can see also the December 6th date, right? So the December 6th date um, shows that the children of Ephraim are connected with that declaration of December 6th, 2021, or 2020, pardon me, right? Okay. So you have that December 6th declaration and that there, there are people in the movement right now, I know, who still support that declaration in the Canadian group. Okay. That they accept that declaration. Right. And that they don't want to have anything to do with these dates. They're more interested in other things that they think are more important. And they put up with it in Colin studies, but they don't support it. So even when Colin's using dates, they don't really support those dates. And we're going to see as his message has failed, as we saw, that, that many are going to turn against that message. So Colin has a, a battle himself that he has to face as his message fails. And you're, and you're only going to have the people in his studies who support Colin that are going to give support. The people who don't support it aren't go going to say anything. Isn't that how it always is? Right, the ones who, who have this other agenda, who've been following Colin or the American group. Right. Um, they have their, their, their belief in which way the message should go. And they're going to see that this failure of Colin's, Colin's message is an opportunity for them to push their message. Right. You know, without going into too much detail. Because I know this is happening already in Colin's movement. 
right, if you want to call his a separate movement. But attached to his message of Trump, um, there's a lot of things attached to it that some people like. But there are many who don't like the dates and the, the numbers. Right? And this is even more true of the American group. If we went if we went back into what happened after October twenty second, eighteen forty four, did we not see that there was a basically a threefold division of those that mm -hmm. had been part of the movement that was that was predicting Christ's return on that day? Mm -hmm. Now, we know that those that came out from that movement that eventually were part of the foundation of the Adventist church were just a small number. I mean, we're talking 50 people. Yeah. But it means that the largest majority of those people went with one or the other of the separate the the separating factions mm -hmm. now we're seeing this same situation occur right now mm -hmm. we have a separating faction that wants to believe that this prediction regarding trump is going to come to the fore right and and we have a group that has not wants nothing really to do with it right uh, and, and they definitely don't like the time elements of it right so um so you have you have people who are waiting to see where things are going to go right so you have that that type of attitude as well but there are still many people who didn't believe in colin's prediction who are waiting on the sidelines because they have their own personal agenda or belief about which way the movement should go. Right. So, I mean, and that's one of the things that I could see when Colin first did his presentation, which is why I, cause I was trying to bring the movement together. I was trying to them to see that Colin had received light from God and that we needed to examine it. Um, and, and it was taken as somehow as if I was interfering with what Colin was saying. But I was supporting what Colin was saying, just asking a clarification on one point to try to understand it. And, you know, which he wouldn't give me that clarification, thinking that I'd been at the study the whole time and had already heard that. But I hadn't. But anyway, you know, so that was December 25th last year. And and this movement now has taken this direction. Um with Collins group and to some degree, the American group, there, there, there really are differences between the two groups. Um, but how that's going to unfold exactly, I don't know, but we're at this conflict, right? So this conflict, I think here, right at, at the crossing of the Jordan, I, I, don't, I think that's where we're coming to. I mean, this conflict has begun, but this 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 shibboleth and sibboleth, being able to frame and to pronounce it correctly, has to do a test of understanding the message. And when it says at that time of the Ephraimites, forty and two thousand fell, I believe that this is going to happen in this movement. How how long it's going to take, I don't know, but I believe that this movement is is heading to this direction and it's going to be um, that the movement is going to fracture even more. Well, <clears throat> the, the situation is <clears throat> as we, as we have been observing from history mm -hmm. that yes, the movement is going to fracture. Mm -hmm. We would like to be able to have a true upper room experience. But just as we 
can observe from scripture. Prior to the final Passover, mm -hmm. there were many divisions that occurred within and with the disciples and those that followed Christ. When Christ made the pronouncement, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, he was not speaking literally, and the people understood that, but their response was, this is an hard saying, who can hear it? We have many that are within and have been on the periphery of this movement that are in disagreement with many points that even Elder Jeff had presented. Mm -hmm. I fear for those that have rejected 9-11. I've had conversations with some that have said that they don't think that 9-11 was the angel of Revelation 18 coming down, but they think that it was something coming from beneath. And they're, they're basically saying that this was not of God, it was more of Islam. Last night, I was reading online, and there was a party that was making a post that you cannot prove October 22nd, 1844 from the Bible alone. And it didn't surprise me that this guy was making this type of a pronouncement, because he tends to like to do that. He tends to want to be a, a person that is sensational because he wants other people to respond to him. But he's also not one that is willing to join with a study such as this. He doesn't want to look at the symbols. He just wants to look at what he sees as being concrete evidence. Now, the Savior went through this, and it was to the point where it nearly broke his heart because he knew that many of those that left at that point would never come back. We're in a situation right now where there's a lot of light that has been coming out from these studies. We are taking the same path that those that followed on the foundations that Father Miller had laid out had taken after October 22nd, 1844. We want our friends to be with us. We want our friends to be able to accept what we are seeing. But we're going to come to the point where many of our friends are just not going to be there. That's a hard thing to say. Mm -hmm. But how else, can, how else can we approach it? Well, I don't think we can really approach it any other way. Um, yeah, so in John uh, 6, verse 66... Right when you have the the statement that you're talking about, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Right, that, that the people are going to flee from him. So they, there's that separation that happens in. Uh, so it's in John six. Here I'm just looking it up. John six verse sixty six. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So we can see that this message is a message that causes this division, right? Right, exactly. Um, and so before the upper room, you have, you have many that leave. And then right. you have those that are in the upper room. And there are going to be people who are not going to want to go to the upper room because they're not going to want to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son right. of God. They're not going to want to go through that death to self. They're not going to want to bear about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. 
They're not going to want to take up their cross and follow him. And, and, and that's not just, that's not really an intellectual issue, right? Because people can be exposed to different levels of light, but willing to follow where that light leads. And that's the question that we have to recognize in ourselves is that it doesn't matter what we know. The light that we have is not going to save us if we don't follow it. And so the movement is coming to this point and it has to, I mean, we see the division that, that exists. I mean, with that type of division, you can't continue on. You know, I, I would have preferred to see this movement come into unity after July 18th. But it just became more and more divided as, as we continued on. And, it, and it's becoming more and more fractured. <clears throat> now, what about some other uh, symbols here that you can see in Judges 12.6? You can see the 42,000. What's that represent? I mean the simple thing that the forty-two thousand represents. Well, I look at I look at forty-two as a doubling of twenty-one. Well, but simply if you deal with the uh, the twelve sixty forty-two months is twelve sixty, isn't it? No disagreement. No. So again, you have this witness of the twelve sixty in this verse. What is twenty-one represented? The 21 represents midnight. <clears throat> yeah. Now, um, and then in verse uh, 7, which is 12 or 7 in reverse, that's July 21st, midnight. Right. right. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. So again, we have this period, a period of time, which is six years. What would be the significance of the six years? Would this be a symbol of the Sunday law? It could be. So one is if we took six times, uh, like six years in prophetic years, would be 2000. Yeah, 2160. So, so we have that symbol of six times six times six in, in that sense. Um, but we also have this tied to the symbol of midnight. Right, in a mirror sense, right? 12, 7 represents 721. Right. Um, so is the message of Jephthah then a message about the Sunday law and a message that leads to midnight? What, whatever midnight is um, in this message of Jephthah. So I would think that the message of Jephthah reaches into the future symbolized by a period of six years. So I'm not taking it as six literal years. And it's judging Israel, right? Jephthah's going to, ju this message is judging Israel. Right. But it means that it's judging all of the movement. Yeah. And the church as well. All right. Right. Because, I mean, we know that this message is not just about this movement. I mean, all of the symbols are tying to events within this movement that are sometimes witnessed to by external events. But the purpose of this movement is to give a message to the Levites, right, to Adventism. And, and the big problem that we've always faced with this is we're, we're studying some things that 
if an Adventist were to watch our videos, they wouldn't have the slightest idea what we're talking about. And, and that's one of the arguments against our message within the movement is how do we give this message to the church? Are we supposed to give them all these dates and all these structures? I mean, we have all kinds of things that we have found. And, you know, to me, the answer to that has always been, it's not about the things we're teaching, it's about who we are. Because in order for us to be a witness to the church, we have to be changed in character. You know, no disagreement on that. Doesn't matter how many videos we make, or how good a quality of videos, or how much literature we publish. Um, as we've studied in the spirit of prophecy, the strongest witness to the truth is a changed life. And, and that has to happen with us if we're going to witness to anyone. And those that are interested in the truth will be drawn to those who have a changed life. It'll be a powerful witness. So we know that time prophecy is a part of this, right? That there, people are being tested on time, right? That's what the 126 is telling us. And, and many can't frame it correctly. And the number that falls is a symbol of the 1260, which is half of the 2520. So it's this division that occurs within this movement over the understanding of time prophecy. I think that's well stated. So... You know, so this, if we're going to put this on a line, then if we're going to take this and add it to the line of Jephthah. Um, so I'm just going to do it this way. Right. So um, I'm going to get to the line of Jephthah here. So this is, is dealing with Jephthah. This was just dealing with the, the 30 years, but we can see that, um, we come to this history at the end of this, um, December 25th, 2021. But this is where the battle with the children of Ephraim is going to begin. In this history, right at the end of this history. Now we know there are events that happen in, in 2020, like the declaration. Um, but it's really December 26th, 2021, after this period of three days, because you're going to have the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th, in which we do these studies, and Colin's study is going to be on the 25th. And so we begin this, this series of studies, understanding the lines, and that's where we're in the midst. And this, this it has been during this period of time, this battle going on with the children of Ephraim, right? I mean, we saw it happening. We saw it happening on December 25th. We saw it happening in one of my studies, Friday night studies on the presidents of the United States. And, and it has continued sort of underground to some degree um, throughout this period of time. And so, when we come to the anniversary, the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th, um, in some ways, this would be the conclusion of that battle, not, not the absolute conclusion, but connected to the conclusion of that battle. So, you know, the question is, are we going to, to study, according to Miller's rules, are we going to follow the counsel of the spirit of prophecy on how we study with someone we differ with, right? Or are we going to continue on with all of this divisive stance and, and not really learn the lessons that we need to learn? I, I think that's what we learn in this, 
in this story of Jephthah. And so any more thoughts? Well, we're at a crossroads. Yeah, we are at a crossroads. The movement is at a crossroads. Um, you know, and I, I've struggled with this personally over this whole this whole issue um, to try to understand what my responsibility is. Um, you know, because I never wanted to really be doing these studies. I mean, it would have been better to have studies coming from the School of the Prophets all of this time um, than me, you know, doing these studies. And and, and we'd started doing some of these studies, like even before July 18th, because, um, you know, the message wasn't being presented even before July 18th. We had to review all of the reasons for July 18th because we weren't really being given those from the School of the Prophets because there was a resistance to that, um, which didn't really make much sense to me. And then we continued with the with these morning studies after July 18th because um, there was nothing coming from FFA, right? I mean, they had the, the Sabbath studies. But, you know, nothing on a daily basis. There wasn't serious Bible study going on, trying to understand things. And then there was a pretense of study by a committee set up on October 30th, um, 2020, that resulted in the, the declaration of December 6th, 2020, which was basically a repudiation of the message. I mean, it was a rejection of everything that Jeff had taught. Right. Right. <laughs> It was remarkable to me, and, and it was predetermined. I mean, they knew what they were going to do. So it wasn't really an honest study. It wasn't following the counsels, either given by the spirit of prophecy or at Jeff's request of what they should do. But Jeff knew that he couldn't continue in those studies. He couldn't continue to sort it out. that the movement was left to do this on its own. And, and the vast majority just ended up rejecting everything that the message was about. But that's still continuing, right? That is, there are people who don't really believe the message while pretending to believe the message. And, and so I don't know, I don't really know how to say it. I mean, to me, I'm just trying to be honest with what I understand happening. But this message of Jephthah will still continue for six years. But not literally, I'm saying, but symbolically. Because it's the message that, that continues to the Sunday law is the way that I take that whenever that Sunday law is, this message of July 18th is a foundational message. Without it, Adventism falls. Because if we take the advancing light that comes from the midnight cry that shines all along the path, if we reject the light at any point along that path, we, we fall into darkness. Right. And, and this has not been understood by Adventism, and, and it's not really understood by people in this message. I mean, especially when you see people rejecting July 18th on the basis that it, the event predicted did not occur. That's a direct attack on October 22nd, 1844. You can't, you can't say, well, I accept October 22nd, 1844, and, and, and say, I reject July 18th, because it's the same. 
There's no difference. Nothing happened on October 22nd, 1844 to all appearances. Correct? Right. Yeah, so, so you can't say, well, July 18th passed and nothing happened, so it's wrong. Well, and, and you can't argue as, as uh, Larry Lesher tried to argue. Well, you know, the next day, Hiram Edson had this vision in the cornfield. Nobody knew about that till, till the 20th years later. To the 20th century, right? It wasn't until 1905 or 1915 or whatever it was that that even became general knowledge among Adventists. Only a few of his friends knew about the vision in the cornfield. And he wrote it out in 1868, and that was never published. So, so you know, it just, to me, the whole thing... Um, of this message. I mean, it's always been about a vindication of Adventism. Adventism stands or falls based upon its understanding of time prophecies. I knew that when I became an Adventist, you know, when I read Kingdom of the Cults and I saw that date there, you know, October 22nd, 1844. Um, which Barnhouse, you know, said that was uh, a face-saving device. Well, I thought, well, you know, if that's a face-saving device, what are you saying about the resurrection of Christ? That's the exact accusation the critics make about Christianity. You know, either it's true, and you can follow it and it's consistent with Scripture, or it's not true. But you can't you can't use those types of arguments. If we're setting aside October twenty second, eighteen forty four, mm -hmm. it also sets aside the four hundred ninety weeks. The seventy weeks are destroyed. The seventy weeks are destroyed. Mm -hmm. If the seventy weeks are destroyed then where is the foundation for the advent of Christ and for his ministry, for everything else? How did Anna and wasn't it Simeon? Yep. The, the two that were there at his circumcision when the baby is presented, they recognize because they had been studying the prophecies. Mm -hmm. They recognized what was going on. So the only prophecy that could have related to this was the 2,300 Arab and Boker. That's the only way that this could, could have been their foundation for understanding what was going on at that time. Mm -hmm. It certainly had nothing to do with Herod. It did have something to do with Rome. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and, and also the destruction of the city and the sanctuary. Exactly. So when situations like this occur, I mean, nothing happened on October 22nd, 1844 mm -hmm. to the vision of man. Right. Because visually we could not see what was going on. Yeah. And what they predicted did not occur. Right. right. So, I mean, the judgment began, but they misunderstood what that meant. But I, you know, I've had to, I've had to consider this with, with July 18th, mm -hmm. whether this is a waymark telling us that the judgment is soon to be completed. Well, within our line, Right. So right. 
because the big problem that we've made is we keep thinking that our lines are relating directly to external events. Now they're, they're warning of external events and our line is illustrating for us as Seventh-day Adventists what is going to happen in the Sunday law, right? So, so many things in this line from 9-11 to 2023 that we have laid out from the story of the judges um, have illustrated perfectly what's going to happen in connection with the Sunday law. But they're illustrated by things within this movement itself. Right. And, and, we, and, and we are going through those tests, in a sense, now, because, and we can't go through them later. In a sense, we're going through them at, ahead of time. For those who close their probation on November 9th, 2019, they're not going to be able to stand in the Sunday law. They will be on the wrong side of the issue. Right? I right. Mean, now, maybe there are some individuals who, you know, that would be an exception because they were kept from the light in various ways. It had nothing to do, they didn't understand the light, right? So God obviously knows the heart. He knows what's going on in each individual. But we would have to say that, um, you know, people who have had light and rejected it, great light and rejected it, aren't going to be convinced later on because they're in darkness. That light can no longer penetrate. They had their opportunity. And so for us, that's happening now. So people are closing their probations based upon the re acceptance or rejection of light, mostly the rejection of light, because we're not at some point where we're now sealed in, I mean, maybe it happens to people, I don't know, but um, people are making a choice. And once you've gone into darkness, you have no hope in that sense. But just because you accepted some truth doesn't mean that you have it made, right? And people always wanted this where, you know, you have it made and you don't, you're not going to sin anymore. And you're just going to, you know, float through this whole situation. But that's not the gospel. Right. So, you know, the so I think, you know, with this line of Jephthah, I mean, I'll try to write the rest of this out. But basically, it brings us to... um. December 26th, as far as I can see it, coming up. And, and then, you know, we're going to have to deal tomorrow with Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, because uh, we've dealt with them before, um, but we can see a bit more how they all fit in. And then, of course, then we're going to have the story of Samson, which is again, this, this line is going to repeat, but in the, in the story of Samson, we remember it's in a negative sense. It's ironic, an ironic story. He's an ironic judge. Okay, so any final questions or thoughts before we close with prayer? I don't think so. Okay, well, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time we've had here this morning, even though it's been difficult to talk about these things, about those that we love and care for. And we know, Lord, that our salvation is not uh, secured in and of ourselves. We know what Christ has done for us, uh, but we know, Lord, that we have choices to make, whether we will follow in the light you've given or not. And so we ask, Lord, that you can come close to each one of us, that we can know your presence, that we can obey your voice, and that we can truly love those uh, that 
make themselves our enemies and that we can minister to those around us. Be with us throughout this day. May you help us through our trials. We pray for each one. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen.